if you're if you have kind of a kink in the chain like in your feet then it's going to go to your ankle then it'll go to your hip and your knee and it'll just go farther and farther up the chain we don't believe it helps so i'm going to try and change your mind on that and that's okay you have your own opinion i'm going to try and change it Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Petio, and I'm the president of the Calgary Neuropathy Association. We've got Louise with us, who's our board secretary. Okay, now the good part. Um, so today we have Dr. Victoria MacArthur. Uh, we're going to call her Dr. Vic. Uh, she graduated from the University of Western States with her doctorate of chiropractic and master's in science in sports medicine in 2020 after completing her bachelor's in kinesiology from the University of Calgary. She has completed training in acupuncture and dry needling through the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College and intends to complete her reactive release therapy training, uh, having now completed her craniosacral therapy level one. Doctor doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Vick's focus is blending active rehabilitation, acupuncture, and chiropractic adjustments to benefit the whole patient. And I know you had sent a whole bunch more, but I have this bad habit of reading it all, and then they, the speakers say, oh, she kind of stole my thunder. So, <laughs> so I decided not to do that this time. So I'm just going to pass it off to you, Dr. Vick. Sounds Great. Hello, everybody. It is very weird. I only have two people on this screen and nobody else. Um, so hopefully somebody laughs at my jokes. If not, it'll just be me. And it's going to be awkward. I will. Um, I'm about to, <laughs> yay. I'm about to make everyone's screens angry because I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I'm very sorry. Here we go. We're going to get that started. Beautiful. Um, so hello. Welcome. We're going to talk about exercise and the aging population today. We're going to get physical, Woo! just like the Olivia Newton song. Yes, I was born in the wrong generation. OK, <laughs> so <laughs> hello, I'm Dr. Vic. I am a chiropractor at Heritage Point Chiropractic and Massage. I am also a GLAD provider and educator, and we'll get a bit into that a little later on. I don't want to spoil all the secrets. I specialize in sports medicine and kinesiology and acupuncture, and I am a member of Being Active for Life. I used to play volleyball in college, where I broke myself a little bit quite gloriously, um, and that's where I fell in love with chiropractic and blending in active rehab along with everything else. Um, I still play. Um, I'm going to keep playing until my body tells me no, and uh, but I'm going to be nice to it. So we're going to get into it a little bit. Let's talk about what we're going to do today. We're going to define what exercise and physical activity is, what types of exercise there are available, and what is a really good option for, for the aging population, the benefits of it, and then some barriers, right? That kind of big chunk, I'm so sorry, it's a little boring. It may be a little repetitive. I try my best to judge it up, but I'm sorry if you zone out. Totally fine. We're going to come back together for common conditions of aging. I just picked four, there is a bajillion. Um, so diabetes and neuropathy, we are the Calgary Neuropathy Association. So we have to at least touch up on that a little bit. We're gonna talk about cancer, we're gonna talk about dementia, and then my little wheelhouse is osteoarthritis. And we're gonna kind of wrap it up all up together. Basically, what I'm gonna try to do today is convince you that exercise is medicine, because it is. So let's talk about it. Exercise and physical activity. They are normally used together pretty interchangeably, but there is a big difference. Um, physical activity is really about any body movement that you do that's making your heart beat faster versus exercise is used for a purpose to either you know improve a function, improve your physical fitness, things like that. Physical activity would be like walking to the bus versus you know, if you're like me and chronically late, you're mostly running to the bus. Um, you can be weightlifting, hiking. Those are all their options, right? Um, with exercise, what we're doing is actually repeating the exercise, increasing the load gradually, and we're going to challenge every single day to improve our physical fitness versus physical activity. You don't always have um, control over the load. 
So how much we're picking up, we're putting down, how much we're like distance and stuff. So you may be doing repetitive tasks, but you may not be improving your function. So there's a difference, but they kind of blend together anyways. Types of exercise, aerobic ones, flexibility and mobility training are becoming quite trendy right now. Strength training is always a big, big one and balance training. So aerobic stuff, that's like walking and running, anything that's improving your cardiovascular conditioning. And that's what CV means there. You Strength training, you gotta think of Arnold Schwarzenegger there. That's what he did. He did a lot of weight training and resistance training. That's to gain muscle and strength. Now he went a little crazy and did a whole bunch of other stuff with it. But for us, what we'd focus on is increasing the function, increasing the strength. Flexibility and mobility, that's a big one. We we lose it as we get older. We'll talk a little bit about some of the reasonings why, um, but we're increasing the range of motion of the joint. We're trying to lengthen a muscle. Most of that is kind of through stretching. And then balance training. And this gets more important the older we get. Unilateral training just means we're doing one side of the body at a time. So you're standing on one leg, you're, you know, maybe closing one eye, I doubt it, but you never know. Tandem walking is when you're heel to toe, heel to toe along a line. And it's basically to retrain your brain and create balance systems to actually work again. So how much should I do? And this is a really common question that I get asked. How much is too much and how much is too little? So the World Health Organization, this is straight out of their literature for older adults over the age of 60, is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 to 150 of vigorous. Now you're sitting there going, Dr. Vic, what the heck does that mean? It's to whatever your subjective perceived exertion is. So my biggest thing that I always check is the talk test. So if I'm walking my dog, let's say, and I can't hold a conversation very easily because I'm getting a little shorter of breath, that would be more moderate to vigorous, right? So it depends how much you can, you can talk and do function while you're doing the exercise. Vigorous is, you know, when I'm trying to ski and not slip and fall on the ice going down the hill, I'm really, really holding on for it. Um, biggest thing is just trying to limit the amount of times that you're sedentary, which means you're not really moving. And you're trying to find fun ways to replace sedentary behaviors with more physical activity. So a good target for me is I always go for 30 minutes a day for five days of the week. That means I have some rest days because I need to recoup. Um, but if you're anything like me, I am the laziest human you'll ever meet. I do not go home and do exercise for 20 minutes after a work day. So I try and do small bouts throughout the day. I'll do 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. This morning, I was a little anxious and nervous to be presenting to you. So I went downstairs and I did 10 minute bike ride. It was great. And now I'm a little calmer. <laughs> um, so what we're trying to do with a lot of this is really get your body to respond positively to the efforts and to release some hormones and get your body to adapt to the process to make you stronger and more fit. Um, 10 minutes of walking, here's some fun calculations. If we do 10 minutes of walking a day, that's 70 minutes a week, right? That turns into 60 hours a year of, ex of exercise or physical activity. At a slow speed, that's 200 kilometers in a year or five marathons. Who would have thought? That's insane. So always remember it is subjective to you to determine how much is moderate and how much is vigorous. And some weeks it'll be different as well. It's not going to stay the same because your body is dynamic. It doesn't stay the same. We don't want it to. Um, next stuff, benefits. I'm very sorry. This is a long list. So I'll try and to shorten as much as I can. The biggest ones I, can are- Can I just slip in there? I, yeah. I've, all, I've always told people too, and people on call have heard this, I call it filling in the bits. So if I'm <laughs> waiting for coffee, I'll do some squats or some like, yes. uh, toe raises and stuff like that, or standing at the, uh, like with a grocery cart in line, I'll be doing, you know, hook one toe behind the other and do, you know, 10 of That's those. Amazing. It's just how I fit it in the day. what I do. Yeah. yeah, that's I all I do. Else actually did it. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, I am so lazy. I have to trick myself into stretching. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty much how you do it. Is like if I'm cooking, which I, 
another thing about me, I'm not the best cook in the world, but hey, I make it work. Or if I'm waiting for coffee, like Linda said, I will do some calf raises. I will do an extra lap around the island. Um, you know, if I have a half hour break at work, most of the time I'm not sitting at my desk. I will try and go um, for a little walkabout is what I call them my walkabouts. Mm -hmm. Just go for a wander. Um, yeah, so it's not necessarily hard to fit this in. And that's where it's like a lot of people get overwhelmed by the idea of having to exercise. And then they're like, oh, my goodness, I'm not exercising. I'm not doing the things. I didn't do enough. Even a little bit is more than enough. Okay, benefits. Reaching or maintaining a healthy weight, you know, strengthening the bones and the muscles, improving your heart and lung function, sleeping better, and feeling happier, right? These are all kind of a big, broad thing in the infograph next to it. But let's get into a little bit here. Um, a lot of the biggest things about uh, getting older is your cardiovascular stuff. So risk of heart attack and lung conditions, stroke, things like that. If we are not using our heart and we're not changing our heart beat and increasing things, then we are not getting better, right? We're not clearing things out. We're not getting that blood moving and we need blood. It's our transportation highway in our body. It moves cells around. Blood sugar and blood lipids are very important, especially when it comes to the neuropathy things. So it, exercise can help lower both of these. And that's massive. Lipid is just fat in, in, in your blood. So we don't want an abundance of fat lingering in there. Muscle and joint is a huge one. Our body responds to load. We'll get a little bit more into that when we get into arthritis and whatnot, but we need to positively load the joints and the muscles so we stay strong. If we don't and we are just inactive, then we start to decondition. Body weight is a huge one, and we'll talk about that a bit more following coming up, but body weight is massive, especially when it comes to cartilage and muscles and joints. Even losing one kilogram of weight will decrease the load on your joint by two to three uh, two to three times because of the act of gravity on it, right? That's massive. Can I ask a question? Um, mm -hmm. Is I've always wanted to figure out how to do this. Is there a way to figure out how many pounds of pressure you're putting on your feet as you're walking so that I know per pound, how much like in my in my mind the heavier you are and i'm overweight um the more damage you're doing to those nerves in your feet as you're mm -hmm. walking or especially running and stuff because of because of the extra pressure because of the extra pounds that you're carrying is there any kind of mm, calculation or way to do that that a person could figure i don't out? There is. I don't know it off the top of my head. Gravity is about 9.8. Um, like the load of gravity is, I think, is 9.8 kilograms per meter per something, something, something. And someone please correct me if I'm wrong. But there's a way to <laughs> take your kilograms and calculate how much force um, of gravity is acting on, on your body. So then that would translate to your feet. Now, your feet are very interesting because they're technically built this is a whole different tangent. I'm very sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> your feet are fascinating and a lot of people don't necessarily work on them. And this is where my sports med comes in because your feet are designed to translate force and spread it out as you move, right? Same with your hips, same with your knees, same with your pelvis. You have force acting on you every single day. And if, you're, if your feet are, st are sticky, that's why I call them where the joints aren't spreading. If we have too stiff of orthotics, you're not getting that nice spread of force through your feet. So then it'll start translating to different joints in your body because mm -hmm. force is not created nor destroyed, right? It's the one of the first laws of thermodynamics and physics. Energy is not created nor destroyed. It has to go somewhere. So in your body, if you're if you have kind of a kink in the chain, like in your feet, then it's going to go to your ankle, then it'll go to your hip and your knee, and it'll just go farther and farther up the chain. Um, so there is a way to calculate that. So then you can kind of be a bit more aware of how much is putting on, on your feet, but it's not just that single specific area. It is farther up the chain than you even realize. And it's, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I always yeah. thought there must be, you know, a lot of people end up with knee pain and hip pain and yeah. just muscle pain in places that aren't related to necessarily to the neuropathy, but I always figured it was some sort of compensation going on. 
Oh, absolutely is. And that's where like, as a chiropractor, I, I work with is I don't necessarily like the words alignment. I'm out of alignment because you're not built to be perfect. You mm. truly aren't. Your body is not. Um, but we want to find optimal balance. And that includes where your force dynamics are going through your joints and your body. Because if you're too far on your toes, when you step, that's going to put way too much weight on the front part of a lot mm. of your joints versus it evenly distributed throughout the cartilage, which is how it's designed. If we start leaning too far on our heels or off to the side, like I have really high arches on my feet. So if we start rotating out a little bit too much on our feet, then we start getting a lot of compression on the outside parts, which will translate farther up the chain. It's it's a very, like, very good question, Linda. Yeah, I've seen a little people. bit of a tangent. Sorry. Uh, well, no, that's what I asked. <laughs> I've seen people though with their, you know, they're starting to roll out onto their sides mm-hmm. of their feet. Um, the guy who's trouble having trouble getting in is one of them. <laughs> and uh, I know I catch myself sort of doing the leaning forward, and I don't know if that's because I have no feeling left in my feet or less feeling in my feet that I start leaning forward because my dad did the same thing, but. It's honestly, a, it's, it's, um, it's such so many factors that add up into, it's all the small things that add into one big thing. And that's where a lot of, of, of medical professionals can get a little stuck is they only look at the big thing instead of starting to chip away at the small stuff. So then or you can affect the big thing. They only look at mm-hmm. their thing, right? We, we all mm-hmm. know that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't it so true? Uh, oh yeah dr vic it's uh yeah what is your view on soft art supports <clears throat> it's kind of a little controversial i'm not necessarily into if you're okay here we go we are way off tangent but i'm okay with it um so i do prescribe orthotics but only to those that need it to help with this to help beef up what you already have i'm kind of in that weird category of your foot is designed to do it we just have to give it the tools to do it properly it's okay like with neuropathy stuff yes pressure that is a huge issue where maybe you're not you don't have your sensation anymore maybe pressure is too much um and things like that so soft is good but i'm not in that category of rigid crazy orthotics there's definitely like even in sports, like a lot of people in hockey will use uh, super feet. And it's not necessarily bad, but you want to make sure that it's not restricting your foot from doing what it needs to because your body's automatically trained. It's got that signal from the brain saying, I'm moving this direction. Let's make this happen. And if you have a restriction through there, it's not going to help at all. It's actually going to make a lot of things worse. Is that sort of that just, uh, that just reminded me. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Louise. No, uh, okay. I was just going to say in terms of soft arch supports, I had at one point mm-hmm. plantar fasciitis mm-hmm. and a podiatrist custom made for me something that was incredibly rigid and it really didn't work. So then I, I uh, went to another one who said, uh, okay, soft arch supports. And he recommended the uh, Dr. Scholl's, uh uh, what is it? Those soft gels thing? They're mm-hmm. perfect. They're perfect. Yeah. And you have to figure out what works best for you too. And that's kind of where it's like, there's no great answer to that question because there's so many factors that go into why you would need it. So some people, yeah, they need a rigid orthotic. Others, they are totally fine with Dr. Scholl's and that is where their happy place is. Things wear out though. So we always have to keep in mind that like Dr. Scholl's will wear out way faster than a custom orthotic. So you just have to make sure that you're giving your foot that 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 support and that TLC, if you will. Mm. People will pay attention to feet. It blows my mind. (laughs) It's crazy. But like with plantar fasciitis, most of the time, I've had it since I was a teenager because I have such high arches and I have I ski. Um, I grew up in Fernie area. And so I have really high arches and narrow foot because of ski boots. So when mine was really bad, people would say, hey, wear an arch, wear an arch support. And it's fine. It does what it needs to do in the short term, but it's not a long term solution. My biggest um, issue is uh, Thank you, Peggy. Um, <laughs> um, the biggest issue for me is I don't have that strength to hold my own foot up. So I've worked on that and I've cured my plantar fasciitis. 
Okay. Um, we are going, where was I? Body weight, mental health. That's a massive one. Um, benefits of that. And I already brushed on that for myself with a little bit of anxiety and nervousness coming uh, today. A uh, little bit of activity. Your body remembers, right? So your body loves motion. And if you can give it to it, it will influence your brain. We'll get a little bit into that a little later as well. Um, but one of the biggest things is um, tied in with pain relief is I am not a runner. I'm sure some of you may have been or are still, and maybe you've gotten that runner's high. We hear about it, but I have never experienced it. I am not a runner. Um, but I do get an endorphin rush from playing sports and things like that. So that endorphin rush is kind of your pain cocktail. Endorphins are your pain med hormones. Um, so if you can get more endorphins, you can have less pain, you can have less pain meds and increase your well-being overall. But with that endorphin, you also get a little bit of adrenaline high, which is your happiness. That little happiness hormone can also make you feel better and healthier. Your brain works better. You have better cognitive function, able to concentrate better, and you can overall turn that pain volume down. And that's, that's massive. Quality of life is a big one, especially as we start talking about cancer and dementia. Um, again. It just increases everything overall. So that helps a lot. Um, social health and disease management and prevention. Social health, I think we've all experienced um, with COVID. We didn't get to see anyone, but humans, we are social creatures. We truly are. So one of the really cool things that's happened is a lot of group fitness classes and things like that. You start to socialize more. So you want to go because you see people that you know and you can relate to. And that's that's a huge part, especially as we get older. We don't have work all the time. We, you know, we don't always have the same functions. And with COVID, it made it very hard and very scary to leave our houses and out of our little bubble. Um, make sure I didn't miss any. There we go. OK, and then um, make sure I got it all. I have little notes in case I go on tangents. <laughs> The other big one that lovely Linda brought up um, while we were talking just before I figured um, put everything together in this wonderful PowerPoint is muscle mass loss. It starts at the age of 30 and it decreases every decade. And most of the time by the age of 60, it doubles. Why is this important? Muscle mass is your structure. It holds you up. Your muscles are strong. They're massive shock absorbers. They have a lot of use for energy and metabolism. But when you hit 30, things start to decrease. It's harder to hold muscle mass. So reality becomes a big issue. Fall risks, fractures, your strength, your function, your activities of daily life, trying to get up off the toilet is a little hard without pulling yourself up with a handle, right? So those are things that can be very scary, especially as you get over the age of 60, because sometimes you're living by yourself. If you fall, you're kind of hooped. So if we can combat that with exercise, that will help decrease a lot of those risks. And we love that. So some barriers, if uh, anyone has any, yeah. Sorry, Dr. Vic, before you move on, uh, there's one question uh, relating to your previous slide. How vigorous and for how long is foot massage good for people with foot neuropathy? Ooh, that is a good question. I don't know. It depends on the type of neuropathy. It depends on the severity of it and everything. I don't necessarily would recommend a direct pressure massage, depending on a lot of things. Again, there's a lot of factors that go into a clinical decision like that. Um, I would have to know more, unfortunately, about the severity, where it's located, what's affected, what kind of neuropathy it is, like if we're just having pain, if we're having numbness tingling, you know, things like that, where it's starting, where it's ending. So it's a good question, but I don't know if I could answer it the way you want me to. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Ron. Okay. In the chat, I would love some of one, some people to just toss out a couple words of what what restricts you from doing exercise? What What kind of barriers are there? Are you finding like I'll give you a hint, maybe maybe motivation, things like that. Oh yeah, fatigue, good one. Any others in there? Time, cost, yes. Let's do, let's do two more. I know, I'm making you guys, it's going to hurt. Very good. 
So pain and muscle, yes. So here's some that I've come up with. I'll use my little mouse. Time is massive one. A lot of people, I don't have time. That's t totally fair. Energy, or you're really tired. Motivation is a huge one for me. Yeah, heart issues, massive. Affordability, how much it costs. It's not cheap a lot of the time for good quality stuff. Accessibility, maybe, you know, you don't have some close to you that has something that offers where you feel comfortable going. Maybe you don't drive and you have to wait for the bus or someone to drive you. Um, pain when you're doing it. Yes, Martha. Um, fear of making it worse. Hurt versus injured. But the thing is, and bear with me on this one, you don't get more disease by being physically active. If anything, it improves it. And we'll, I'm going to prove that to you guys. Don't know where to start or it's overwhelming. I don't know if anyone's walked into a gym and immediately turned around and went, nope, 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 because there's people lifting and grunting and oh, it's a little intimidating. It can be a lot. And also, you don't know where to start. That's my biggest issue. That's why I work such place at home. Me too. <laughs> Sociocultural priorities. So I put this one because of, of a, a very interesting thing and trend that I've noticed. And you can say I'm wrong, I do not mind at all, is gender roles, flexibility as you get older, and then North American versus Southeast Asian cultures. So gender roles, if you are a female, there is, when you hit it as teenage years, there is so many females that dropped out of that physical activity or sports. It is a wicked massive um, percentage. It's like 30% or something of most girls will no longer participate in sports by the time they're teenagers. That drops even more when they hit their 20s and start going to university or start jobs and things like that. Then women, we start having kids you know, and get married, our priorities shift. We don't take care of ourselves. We're taking care of others, right? Um, there's, um, and then as we get older and older, we take our kids, you know, you take your kids to uh, sports, but you're not participating yourself. So there's a big kind of priority shift with gender roles, which, which is massive. And you see that in a lot of the research in osteoarthritis. One of the biggest non-modifiable risk factors is your gender, which is being a woman. You will be at a higher risk than men for getting osteoarthritis. Flexibility and aging. This one's really cool. So a lot of research shows that at age five, we lose our flexibility. Why is that? Five. At age five, we drop in flexibility. Why? What happens at age five? We go School? to kindergarten. Yeah. What do we do at kindergarten? We sit and we sit more and we sit more as we go through middle school and elementary school and high school and even more in university. And then we go to work and we're sitting at what? Desks. So we're sitting as a society in North America, eight to 10 hours a day. That's huge. Sometimes more. Some people sit more than that. And yes, there's some jobs that, you know, this is a generalization. There's a, there's a lot of things that you can do to combat that. Like myself, I don't sit as much in my job because it's very active. But I do, I do some home and sit a lot and watch a lot of Netflix. Um, the difference is, if you look at a lot of Southeast Asian cultures, they don't have that. They have a lot of elders that are sitting on the ground, crisscross applesauce or kneeling. Why? Because they don't stop. They are up and down. They're moving. They don't sit as much as we do. They are moving more. And that can be, that is massive. Um, and that's the, the other thing, barriers, we don't believe it helps. So I'm going to try and change your mind on that. And that's okay. You have your own opinion. I'm going to try and change it. But if you don't, that's totally fine. Mm, in school, the chairs are not set up. for Yes. A lot of the time, we don't have good chairs at all. Um, it's becoming a bit more popular with a lot of like the newer teachers. They'll have like um, a lot more places for them to sit on the floor. They'll have like I have one teacher that I know in middle school. She has a basketball hoop in her in her um, in her room, and she also has like two treadmills. So if kids need to move, they go ahead. It's crazy. Um, so boring parts done. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Now we're going to talk about a couple common conditions. We're going to start with diabetes and neuropathy. Um, we all kind of know 
what this is. Um, it's in uh, diabetes. There's many types you can have. It's an insulin sensitivity or lack of insulin production. So you ask me, what the heck is insulin, Dr. Vic? It is the key that opens our cells so we can get sugar into our cells and use it. That is the biggest thing. Now, if you have type one, what means is you aren't producing enough insulin. So then you don't have any keys to open any doors. So then you don't have any sugar going into cells and you basically are wasting away. Type two is because you have too much insulin, too many keys, too many doors. You have no idea which ones fit into what and you can't get anything anywhere. So you have a backlog of sugar and nothing being used. So you can get neuropathy like many of you know. Neuropathy just means nerve problem, right? So you can get an overload of sugar on the nerves and irritate them like crazy. What's interesting about diabetes is 11 million Canadians have it or have prediabetes. So they will be going up that, um, that spectrum and increasing. 11 million. Our population is 33 million. That's 30% of our population. A third of it has diabetes of some kind. That also correlates to how much obesity we have recorded in Canada is about 30% as well. That's a little scary. Linda, so, did you have a question? Yeah, I do. So even people, because I don't have diabetes, at least not that I know mm. of, um, mine is <laughs> genetic. And uh, we have we have root causes for neuropathy like all over the map. So diabetes yes. is just a sort of a small group. But I still find no matter that the kind of diet, that the kind of neuropathy that you have, that sugar is a problem. It doesn't seem to matter. Um, and and if and if it makes it flare, it seems to me, even if diabetes isn't a problem, if sugar is making your nerves flare, then sugar is something you want to be very careful with either way. Very true. And there's been, a, it's very interesting, 50 years ago, or maybe it was maybe 100 years ago, the um, average American diet in a, in a year had something like two pounds of sugar in it. But in a week now, most people have quite a significant amount of sugar in their diet. Our bodies aren't meant to process that. It's, it's crazy how much and sugar is and Thank you for segueing into the next little bit about neuropathy. Um, what happens with a lot of neuropathy in diabetes, but it can happen in other types, but I figured you guys already knew a lot of more than I did about a lot of that. So I just didn't even touch it. Um, there's damage to the blood vessels, right? Because what happens is water follows sugar. It's a concentration gradient. So the nerves are super delicate. I call them finicky little fickle creatures. They really, really, really truly are. They're very delicate, they're very fragile, and they do not like being irritated. But if you have a backlog of sugar, like we've just talked about in any component, it doesn't necessarily have to be diabetes, but if you have a backlog of sugar and other types of, of, of um, substances that's drawing um, water to the area, then you're gonna have swelling and inflammation and irritation. And that's just gonna be a host of tornado of issues. So our biggest thing is trying to decrease sugar, but also to move it away from the nerves. And that's where we're gonna segue way next slide. But these are some risk factors of diabetes. Type one is mostly family history, pancreatic disease and infection or illness, right? Those are kind of things you can't necessarily control. Type two, family history is big. Weight can be MI, so body mass index, physical inactivity, age, and overall health. So if you smoke, blood pressure, cholesterol, things like that. But the thing is, exercise can help with a lot of the type 2 diabetes things because those are all exercise that we've been able to combat, right? So how can exercise help? It lowers the blood sugar. How, does, how is that a thing, right? So we kind of talked about how water follows sugar, but it goes to the nerves because there's a backlog. So it's not being used, but muscle cells love sugar. So if we're not making our muscles work and we're not making them demand the sugar, it's not going to go there. So we can't use it. So it gets backlogged. So one of our things is we need to move that sugar. Exercise is one of the best ways to do it because it's making our muscles work. Decreasing stress is a huge part. Stress will start your fight or flight mode, which actually makes your body more saturated in sugar because it's preparing for the long haul sprint away from a saber-toothed tiger. Your body doesn't know the difference. 
So your body is preparing and overloading and giving you all this sugar and has nowhere to go. And it just stays there. And then it starts more irritation. So exercise can help with that because again, it moves it, improves your sleep. I mean, if you are hopped off on sugar, just think of a toddler that you <laughs> that had way too much candy. Oh, of course, you're not going to sleep. I don't sleep well with that. Um, weight management is a big one, right? Um, that one's kind of called for anyways. Weight is a big part of type 2 diabetes and neuropathy because like we talked about a little bit before, Linda, the pressure on the nerves. If we can decrease the pressure, the nerves will be a little tad happier. Fickle, fragile little things. Um, decrease the risk of complications. So in a lot of neuropathy and diabetes issues, there is the kidney issues, the foot and leg issues that you can get from everything kind of being drawn down because of gravity. The eyes, those ones are, those nerves are the most fragile and most finicky little things. You can start losing your vision, right? Because your sugar is attacking that. Your heart attack and stroke, you're getting a backlog of sugar. That's clogging up a lot of your arteries. Things are not moving nicely. So you can end up getting um, clots and issues and anxiety. Like I talked about with that kid hopped up on sugar. Anyone's gonna have heart palpitations. <laughs> myself included. And I love candy. Um, but if we can start moving that sugar and get things more efficient, that's huge. I saw Linda go off mute. Do you have another question? Liz? <laughs> oh, I forgot what it was now. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Come back. Um, and then muscle atrophy. And Linda brought this up as well as we were conversing is a lot of the time with neuropathy, because we're not having full function to that muscle. We're not getting that firing of the nerves to say, hey, you got to move. Let's dance. Um, so one of the ways exercise helps is it combats it. Research has shown that exercise can moderately increase your muscle strength and atrophy. Atrophy meaning muscle wasting, right? It can reduce your neur neuropathy pain because there's less stress on the nerves by controlling the blood sugar. So that's just a nice little summary of kind of everything that we've talked about already. So this is a fun is muscle is yeah. muscle wasting actual damage or is it just shrinkage because you haven't been using it as much or it it can be both. Mm. Right. So atrophy is kind of like a catch-all term of the fact that you have less. Right? So it could be muscle wasting or it could just you have less muscle because you're not using it because it's detrained. So it's just this kind of catch-all term. So it, so you can, yeah. Um, with this lovely graph, this is from a study showing um, weight changes in kilograms and the relative risk to getting type 2 diabetes and neuropathy. You can see, and I'll move my like, beautiful little mouse here, if this is zero, your risk is about one if you have no change. But as we start to gain weight, we almost double, oopsies, all right, we got a little excited. Here we go. We almost double from three to six our risk in, in from 10 to 15 kilograms. That's massive. But you can see as we start going a little farther down, we get close to that zero. And that's where we want to be. That is beautiful. So it, and it shows like it leads to remission as well in about 80% of patients with obesity. Very interesting. So I've also heard somewhere along the way that people who are taller and just generally a bigger frame um, are are at higher risk than somebody who's small and petite because I guess of the same reasons. Is that a good assumption? Or? Maybe. Um, that, that's a really good question. I have not heard that myself maybe it could influence that but most of the time when you have different heights and weights you have to also look at I don't really love body mass index it's a really good outcome measure to where to start but honestly I've been overweight since I was 15 years old because I'm a lot of muscle I'm very athletic so I'm five foot seven and I'm overweight and I have been for years um so being tall yes maybe it would increase your risk a little bit but it also comes into factors of how much body fat percentage do you have how much muscle mass to fat mass do you have there's a lot more calculations that go into it versus just like 
here's a number, here's a number, here's a calculation. Mm -hmm. It's the BMI is a good indicator of where to start, but it is not the be all end all that it should be that a lot of people put a lot of like, oh, this is the standard. It shouldn't be. Um, so I haven't necessarily heard of that, but it's not necessarily always my wheelhouse. So I could be very wrong. <laughs> so you ask me, what are the best practices for diabetes? Aerobic training, which is getting your heart rate up, running, walking, swimming, things like that. More fat, fat burning, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, resistance training to increase the strength. Balance training, that's huge. As we start getting neuropathy, we start kind of losing our balance because we're not getting the signal sent back to our brain where we are in space. And flexibility training. Those are some of the high ones, but any exercise is good exercise. Dr. Vick. This lovely... Yes, sir. Sorry, before you. Uh, oh, okay, my uh, GP told me that if you go back to that slide, if we're going to choose one thing, aerobic training is what I need to do most of, rather than uh, the uh, Pilates and and other things like that. That that mm -hmm. for. Lowering, I have high cholesterol, so for lowering uh, the lipids, etc., aerobic training. Mm -hmm. So if it's a choice between working out on the um, elliptical or Pilates, he said, spend your time on the elliptical because that is really aerobic cardiovascular training. But what? And what do you want and to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean. It's kind of to what your patient, what your preference is. I don't see any issue if you wanted to do a 40 minute session of Pilates, your heart rate's still going up. And that's where it's kind of interesting where like, if you do like my uh, calorie tracker, things like that, you only lose calories when you're doing um, cardio, right? But you lose calories no matter how much you're moving. So if, yes, if you wanted to do Pilates, what I would do is mix it together or do one one day and one the other, because you don't want your body to get, like your body's not, you know, muscle memory and things like that. That's very, very much needed. Hang on, my brain is just going crazy. Holy moly, <laughs> it's such a good question. Um, so what I would do is a mixture of all of these. And if you can do it all together, that's fantastic. But I don't see why you should be one over the other. Okay, thank Does you. that make sense? Does. Thanks. Is the rowing machine? Rowing machine is an amazing aerobic workout. I actually recommend that to a lot of people with posture issues because it does strengthening and cardio at the same time. Your body's meant to move. It doesn't matter how it moves. We just need it to move at point. Aerobic training, Louise, would be fantastic. I'd say if you did 15 minutes of it of moderate to vigorous. And then if you want to do 15 to 20 minutes of Pilates after, that's a wonderful mix. Wonderful. Because you're getting the benefit of both. So if you have time to do both, do both or break it up because the best exercise is the one that gets done. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so with this, this is from Diabetes Canada. It's a wonderful handout if you have no idea where to start. This just talks about resistance exercises because this is the most common question I guess is what ones do I do? So it kind of talks about the benefits. You know, this is the rated perceived exertion of how hard it feels to you out of 10. And then it kind of gives you some nice guidelines of like how many to do, things like that. And then they have all these wonderful exercise guidelines of, hey, maybe try these. Now, this does not mean you have to do all of these all at once, because honestly, I won't do them all at once in one sitting. I would pick maybe four and do them really well and then pick four new ones next day and the day after and just rotate through until I find my favorite. Because if you're not enjoying doing exercise, what the heck are you doing, you know? Um, so that's a really good resource and I've made it a link. So when we have a copy sent out and the recording sent out, then you guys can just click on it if you're interested. Now there's wonderful resources also with Diabetes Canada and also with the Calgary Neuropathy Association. You guys have some wonderful resources online. I have been snooping. Any questions before we move on to cancer? Nope, looks like we're pretty good. And now you're going, Dr. Vic, what the heck do you mean exercise can help with cancer? Listen, it can. <laughs> um, so cancer is a growth of abnormal cells in the body. 
right? There's many types, many stages, many treatment options. It's insane. Um, there's over 100 types of cancers. But here's the thing, modifiable risk factors. Physical inactivity is the first one. Nutrition, smoking, sleep, and stress. All things that we've technically already talked about. Interesting. These are the things that you can control. And now we're going to talk about why exercise can help with cancer. And I'm going to prove to you that it can, because guess what? There's already research and it's happening here in Calgary at the University of Calgary through Thrive Health. I have no idea if anyone's heard of this. This makes me so excited. Um, so there's lots of options, lovely Marsha, with um, can't standing without assistance or can't get onto the floor. There's a lot of seated stuff, like seated yoga is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. There's Tai Chi, there's so many options. So if you have things that you have questions about, you can always reach out to me after and we'll get to that after, okay? Um, exercise and cancer. So exercise helps, and this is like full studies of psychological benefit. Treatment for cancer sucks, right? So it's going to help with that, combating the anxiety, the depression. We've already talked about the benefits of mental health with exercise. The side effects of treatment, which is fatigue, and that is nausea, and that's sleeping, things like that, all have been shown to help. Wellness overall, you are going through massive changes with cancer in your body from treatment, from getting radiation and chemo. It's insane. Um, so this just helps overall with wellness. Cancer-related fatigue, um, that one's huge. It's the number one common symptom of treatment. So if you know, you're feeling bad, you'll stop doing activity, which then actually deconditions you and it actually leads to more fatigue due to your lack of endurance. So doing the stairs becomes harder and harder because you're not training for it anymore. Your body is no longer doing it. So you don't use it, you lose it. Cardiovascular side of it is big because again, our body's going through massive crazy changes and it's getting just hit from left, right and center. We don't need more issues with heart and lungs. Now, Combating cachexia. Now, a lot of people are like, what the heck is cachexia? That is a complex metabolic wasting syndrome that's from unintentional loss of your skeletal muscle mass um, with or without fat loss. So that's when you can get enunciated, right? Um, it cannot be reversed by standard nutritional treatment and it actually leads to more functional impairment. It is 20 to 40% of the all cancer deaths are because of cachexia. But the, it's muscle wasting, it's organ failure, and it's systemic inflammation. We've already talked about inflammation with neuropathy, because where sugar goes, water goes. But that also is the case with cancer, because you have just this whole body inflammation. So exercise can combat it because it's increasing your muscle cells, improves your organ failure, and decreases your systemic inflammation overall, right? It's shown that treadmill walking or resistance training can actually improve your protein synthesis, which is your muscle building, decrease your protein breakdown, which is your muscles breaking down and being used for energy, which is actually not very good. And it improved oxidative capacity. Oxidative capacity is just how much oxygen your body needs to survive. So we can increase it, improve it, so it makes it so it's easier to do things. Um, quality of life is massive. Your quality of life is not good when you're having when you're going through cancer in any stage of it. So this, you get social side of things, you get oopsies, um, you get um, your wellness, your mental health, everything. Your fatigue gets a little better. Um, this is from the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, they're recommending 150 minutes per week of moderate for cancer survivors. And this is cancer survivors. Um, 75 of vigorous or an equivalent combination. So you can mix it all up. They do recommend strength training and they do recommend flexibility. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide because there is another one on here that's very important. Um, so best exercise for cancer that they found through the Thrive Center is aerobic training, right? Resistance training and yoga style training. It is safe to exercise throughout the whole cancer journey. We just have to make sure to tailor it to what your body needs at that time and what your individual needs are. What they recommend 
is actually 90 minutes of moderate intensity, stretching most of the days and strength two days a week. So this is a little different than any of the other recommendations we've had, but mostly our biggest thing is to move when you can and some is good, more is better. Because some days you're gonna have poo days. Other days you're gonna have great days and, and using what you have is important. So we just finished cancer, any questions with that? I think we're doing okay. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've been trying to um, take notes and look stuff up as we've been talking, but one thing I did want to mention, of course, is that chemotherapy does cause neuropathy. So if you've already got something oh, else yeah. and you end up with cancer now, you've got a double whammy. That's my biggest fear. So yeah. um, taking good care of yourself, if that unfortunately happens to any of us is going to be so important Very scary. because those cancer yeah. treatments are brutal on your nerves. We've got a number of yeah. people in our group that are uh, chemo-induced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so exercise can at least help a little bit with that. A little bit goes a long way with a lot of those situations. Yeah. Um, dementia and cognitive delays. So dementia is um, kind of more of an umbrella term, and I'll use it today to kind of catch all the ones um, like Alzheimer's, vascular, Lewy body issues, okay? Um, just because we're just doing a brief overview of it. Um, but it's mostly loss of memory and other thinking abilities with that's severe enough to affect your daily life. Um, it is not a normal part of aging. That's what's interesting. You have difficulties with like thinking, problem solving, language, if it's severe enough, or your or your ability to even perform daily activities. And it changes in your mood and your behavior. Um, the thing is, the cause is still very much unknown. No one knows where it comes from or why you get it. There is a genetic link, but doesn't always mean you're gonna get it if your family has it. Um, so it can be a little scary. Risk factors, all of the lists are here. Diabetes, obesity, lack of physical activity, poor diet, alcohol abuse, depression, social isolation is massive. We've been through a lot of that lately with COVID. Age, sex, and genetics. Those are all bolded because those are things you can't necessarily change. Um, all the rest of them, you can. Exercise and dementia. What I love about this one is it helps maintain routine and patterns. So with, with a lot of dementia issues, um, any change to a routine, kind of will throw you off a little bit. So what's really nice is exercise can actually help settle the nervous system and the anxiety related to that of the not knowing. And it kind of helps reorganize a few things. Just like with a lot of anxiety related cognitive conditions, the body remembers. So if we can give it some motion, it resets a lot of things. Wellness overall, as the disease progresses, you know, there's many functions that you lose or are delayed. Walking is a big one. Um, daily activities like shaving or holding yourself up or doing the stairs. Um, but exercise is helpful because it can increase or maintain your muscle strength and your function, um, which can create more longevity and increase your quality of life. Depression is a big one that a lot of dementia patients suffer from. And we talked about already that endorphin rush, that happiness hormone that you can get from exercising. So that helps combat it and social well being. In many homes, especially over COVID, there was not really a great opportunity to be social, but we are social creatures. So group exercises, things like that can really help with that and combat the depression and anxiety side and that self-isolation. It also reduces your fall risk. We talked about the strength of that. You lose your balance, you lose, lose your ability to walk a little bit. Falling is huge. It's very scary. We don't want to be having our hips figured out in the hospital, in the ER, not remembering where we are. The other biggest one is it improves and maintains independence. When you have a patient with dementia, a lot of the time that independence is lost. So this can help keep it a little longer or at least spark a bit more of it. Um, there's a really cool program that just started in Ontario. I have reached out to them to see if it's in Alberta yet. I have not heard back, so fingers crossed I will hear soon. But they do um, dementia-based exercises and you can be trained how to do it and deliver it. So fingers crossed, maybe I'll add that to my long list of things. Um, aerobic training is huge, resistance training, balance training daily, because we lose that. And same with neuropathy, right? You start to lose that control of balance. So doing balance training every day is huge and just everyday movement in general. A lot of the time, you know, 
uh, dementia patients don't necessarily move. They don't have that uh, motivation anymore. They, they kind of forget. Um, so getting them out, getting them gardening, getting them walking, things like that, massive. They're recommending 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous. So we've seen that already. Um, and doing balance training, twice a week strength training. We've seen that already as well. And regular movement throughout the day. So getting up and even walking around the kitchen island still counts. This is also another, re uh, this is one of the resources that I've linked for you guys in case you have any other questions or you wanna look in into it a bit more. It's a wonderful program. My bread and butter. Um, you will here. you will provide the slides, right? I don't think you have yet. Yes, yes, yeah. I haven't yet, but I will be sending them to Linda, and then she'll share them with everybody. Yeah, there. I'll put I'll get, I, put them up on the website with your video. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah Margo. Sorry, I was just reading a little chat there. Yeah, Margo, that's wonderful that your sister feels better after moving, and that's the thing. Walking is still an aerobic exercise. So if she feels better moving around, if you can't walk, that's okay. You can still do so many other things. There's, we had, we had a question fun. ask earlier about a rowing machine. And I thought a rowing yes. machine, that's perfect for somebody who's really sensitive on their feet. Yeah. Absolutely. You do have a bit of pressure through your feet, but it's not the same amount as gravity going down because it's more horizontal. Yeah. But yeah, I love rowing machines. I try and get uh, my patients on them as much as I can, which I think I'm a little crazy, but it's okay. It's kind of in the job description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and dehydration causes a form. I mean, it could. I haven't heard of that, but I completely believe you, to be honest. Um, dementia, I don't necessarily diagnose it. That's not in my wheelhouse. So I don't always know exactly all of them to look for. I mostly help with um, maintaining and managing it as best as we can. Um, okay, osteoarthritis. Here is my bread and butter. This is my favorite because this is musculoskeletal stuff. Woo, this is joint. So osteoarthritis, it is a degenerative disease of the cartilage, the whole joint and the surrounding structures. A lot of people believe it is a wear and tear disease. And you could look at it that way, but it's more of a breakdown of the cartilage and the surrounding tissues. Um, it is the leading cause of inactivity in people over the age of 65. That's, that's, a, that's a significant number. Six million Canadians have it, so that's one in 10. And if you don't have it, you might get it. You never know. It's commonly associated with sarcopenia, which is just a fancy word for muscle mass loss. And if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, the thing with OA, it can affect any joint in the body where the cartilage covers the ends. So the most common, as we see here, is hands, fingers, knees, and hips. And that's where we start getting joint replacements. Number of people with OA technically increases with age, but age does not cause OA. It just means there's more people that are older that have it. Um, it has led people to believe that they should not move or be physically active because it hurts. So why would I move it if it hurts? But actually cartilage needs to be loaded through physical activity to keep healthy. And that's where it's more, less of a wear and tear disease and more of the fact that it's a degenerative and regeneration imbalance. Our cartilage is actually a sponge. It doesn't have very good blood supply to it, so it can't heal itself easily. Our blood brings healing cells, nutrients, and oxygen to the area. If you roll your ankle, what happens? You blow up like a balloon. That is because your body is trying to heal it by sending blood to the area. Now with OA and with cartilage degeneration, you don't have that ability. You might get red hot and angry, and you might have some swelling around the knee or the hip, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going into the joint. The cartilage is a sponge. It needs to be wrung out to squeeze out all of that waste products and those toxins. And then it needs to be offloaded. So like a sponge, you can suck up all that clean water and all that new nutrients to regenerate. When we don't have dynamic load on the cartilage, we start to have too much degeneration and not enough good cells to help regenerate it. And that's the wear and tear idea. Risk factors of OA, Things you can modify are joint injury. So healing, let's say you, uh, you used to play soccer and you didn't heal your knee properly because you just kept playing on it. Hello, nice to meet you, that is me. Um, joint overload, 
excessive weight, like we've talked about how much, you know, kilograms to the joint, physical inactivity and muscle weakness. Muscles are shock absorbers. They help offload the cartilage. So if we're not strong to take the shock of that, we start to load too much into our into our cartilage and our ligaments and our joint. And then there's no regeneration that happens. And all we have is complete plummet. Is there regeneration for cartilage? If you start, mm -hmm. you can, hey? Yeah. 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 It's not, no one's going to have an 18 year old's knee anymore unless you're, you know, 18. But there are ways for it to lubricate. We need to get that WD 40 into that joint or else it's just going to be rusty and it's not going to move. So we have to not necessarily force it, but we have to try and replenish some of that WD 40 and that lubrication. So then it will move and it'll move easier. Um, so this is where the GLAD comes in. So GLAD is an actual full program developed in Denmark. It stands for Good Life with OA, and it is a whole exercise program. Um, what they've done is they've gone, okay, well, our public health has decided that everybody, you get a knee replacement and you get a knee replacement and everyone gets hip replacements. But guess what? That makes it so it's a two to three year wait list. That was happening in Denmark. So in 2013, what a whole bunch of physios, chiros, and trainers did is they looked at the research because there's no good protocols on uh, exercise for OA. There's like a gambit of just a whole bunch of recommendations, but there's no actual good guideline. And that's a lot of the case in a, in a lot of these conditions we've talked about. So what the GLAD group decided is we're going to take all this evidence and we're going to make it simple and we're going to make a program. And then we're going to study it to make sure that it works. So in 2013, between the years 2013 and 2019 in Denmark, they had 50,000 patients go through the program. 50,000 across the whole country of Denmark. That's a pro and approximately 10,000 people currently in the program each year. They started setting it up in Canada as of 2019. We have an average of 3,000 participants per year at 209 sites in nine provinces. But the thing is, it is not currently publicly funded. So that really puts a damper on a lot of things because affordability is a huge part of this. And most people are over the age of 65 in this program because OA is more common to happen as you get older. But the thing is, here's the fun research from it. 29% reduction in pain in a seven-week exercise program. 29% on average. Some people have more. A 30% increase in function, your ability to do the stairs, your ability to take your grandkids to the zoo, getting up off the toilet, getting out of bed. Those are whole massive things that if you can't do them, that really restricts your lifestyle. And finally, a 45% increase higher quality in life. What? That's huge. And that's just Denmark research. Canada's numbers are very, very similar to this. Insane. And all they did was exercise. So here is their treatment pyramid that they like to talk about. So a lot of the time, especially in Alberta, we pretty much start at the second row and then we go to the third row. But we have way too many people in the need of surgery row because we haven't even done the first row. Yeah. So education, Talking about what the heck OA is and how I can convince you to move your body to help it and how we can find self-management strategies besides just popping some Tylenol. Exercise, how to move your body, when to move your body. That's all important and weight control if needed. So that's where everyone should be, but not everyone is. That's where chiro, physio, and trainers come in, right? In Canada, only 11% of GLAD providers are chiropractors, but seniors over the age of 65 all have Alberta Blue Cross benefits for chiro, but they don't have it for physio. So there's a whole financial side of things that's not even being touched that could benefit a significant amount of people. The second row, pharmacological pain relief. So Tylenol, um, pain meds, things like that. Passive treatments given by a therapist, so wearing a brace, you know, maybe TENS machine, maybe ice or heat, and then surgery. Everyone seems to end up in the surgery thing. The thing that's cool about GLAD is they're not saying surgery is bad. They're just saying not everyone needs it right away. So why don't we distribute the need 
and try and take some people down a step so then we can actually give the people that really need it that attention. It's funny. I look at that pyramid and I think for neuropathy, yeah, they go right to the pharmaceutical pain reliefs. Yeah. We don't have surgery options for the most part. There's nope. a few that do. Generally makes for it worse. Part, we don't. <laughs> and education, exercise and weight control. Well, the education and we promote exercise, uh, weight control is a little harder, but um, that's where, where we're trying to fill a, a gap. And we're like the only one in Canada for neuropathy. It's so Isn't sad. Isn't that insane? It's so sad. It's, it's almost, in my mind, negligence. Yeah. like you're you're making it so people are ignorant to the fact that this one simple thing can help yeah. it's actually very simple right like um brenda was saying she th swims three times a week that's insane yeah. and yeah i wish you could deduct it off your income tax as well me too <laughs> i was thinking of that in the car the other day i was like man it'd be so great because so many people would exercise so many people because it would be so accessible to them oh it breaks so my heart it truly I'm, does i'll interject here if you're um below a certain uh, financial level fair calgary is always fair access calgary is always an option so you can apply okay. and get um, reduced rates at all the city facilities just so people know that and if anybody's interested they can uh, email me and i'll try and figure out how to do that I will probably be reaching out to you so that I have that as well, because that's fantastic. I didn't actually know that was a thing. So handy. Um, this is one really interesting thing where I'm going to hit home that exercise is at least as effective as medicine and weight loss for OA. So on the left here, we have out of 100%, right? So effect size is we want that nice moderate. Small to moderate is okay. Exercise, getting close to that 60% there. That's pretty impressive for pain and function. Function probably a bit more 50%. Acetaminophen, NSAIDs, that's Tylenol and Advil and ibuprofen and knee brace. If we combo all of these three, which is in the bottom half of our, our bottom step of our pyramid, that's getting pretty close to 100%. That's huge. But even if you combo all these together, it doesn't even get close to that. It gets maybe to 80. So we have 20% difference just by doing exercise with weight loss and education. Wild. So best exercises. And this is where I come in. The GLAD program is really cool. You actually can put it through your benefits, which is wicked, and technically claim it on your taxes because you get a receipt that has my wonderful license number on it. So you can put that on your taxes. Um, the whole point of it is neuromuscular exercises. So what we're trying to do is actually retrain your body on how to move the joint. And that's by changing your neuro function to the joint and then making your muscles strong to hold it there. So we're really working on joint alignment. This is the only time I like that word. <laughs> and balance, right? So we don't want to be collapsing in. We don't be rotating too far out. You can also do non-weight bearing aerobic activities, such as swimming, right? Just like neuropathy, taking pressure off of that nerve, off of that joint. Biking is a huge one because you can watch where your knee is or your hip is, make sure everything's where it's supposed to be. Elliptical is a little harder because sometimes it makes you turn in or turn out too much. Um, there's so many options for you. These are a couple of the exercises that you do. Now I can't unfortunately give away the, um, you know, away the whole goose here. So I only gave you a couple of them, but we do circuit training and you have a couple exercises per, per section and then you get to work out. Um, if you have any other questions about it, GLAD Canada is fantastic. They work with the Bone and Joint um, Society as well. And there's so many places around the city. Um, they have a whole list. Now, let's wrap it all up together. Um, uh, Dr. Vic, question. Yes, what yeah. is the what rowing machine would you recommend can you recommend a brand i don't have one off the top of my head unfortunately okay. um because i'm still technically looking for some that i like that are actually not outrageously priced um i do like the ones that actually have water in them but that is starts to get into the few thousand dollar price range which really hurts your bank account there are some very simple ones you can get on amazon for like two or three hundred dollars that are resistance ones those are fantastic 
You don't need anything crazy. That's where a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I have to get like all this big fancy stuff. You truly don't. There's even, um, I don't know if they've made production yet, but there's, um, there is one that's, they made a travel one and it's like $500. It's called, I think it's called Whip It. Um, I have to, I'll have to find it, but it comes in, it's a little box and then you can connect all the things and then you can pretty much have a travel rower slash paddle boarder slash, and you can put different attachments on it and it's cross country skiing as well. So you can do it from home in a very small section. I, I don't know if they've produced it yet, but I saw it um, about a year ago and I signed up for the emails, but I am sometimes bad about checking those emails. So I will try and find it. I'm going to write it down on my list of things. Um, and, and I'll act- send it to Linda. Actually, that uh, reminds me, my parents had at one point a Nordic track. That's one of these stationary, uh, well, cross-country ski machines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Health rider. Yeah. It's similar. Exactly. You mostly just need to find something that works best for you in the space that you have. Um, sometimes you might need it to be mounted. Sometimes uh, certain ones are mounted to the wall. Other ones are just heavy enough. Or if you want to be able to fold it up, um, depends what kind of space you have for rowers. Same with treadmills, same with bikes. It's mostly what is going to work best for you. Um, and I always recommend, you know, try it out, make sure that you can return it. Cause if you don't like it, Try it out, get a different one. Thank you. No problem. All right, here we go. Wrapping it up together, folks. Exercise amount and intensity is subjective, like we talked about. Not a cookie cutter approach. You have to figure out what what works for you. And sometimes that can be a little bit of trial and error, which is unfortunate. I wish I could have a magic wand and everyone just gets better and has all the answers right away. I would be a millionaire by now, but that is not the case. Common themes. Did anybody notice the little stars that I put everywhere? (laughs) Because I don't know if you noticed every single condition we talked about, and that's just four out of a whole heck of a lot, that physical inactivity was one of the main risk factors associated with that condition. That's huge. Um, Muscle mass loss is related to aging. Very much so. We've talked about that. And exercise is medicine. I'm going to show you a few quick little infographs because I think it really hits home the numbers and the statistics because we haven't really done massive numbers and statistics. So this is a weird vicious cycle that can happen. You end up getting, you don't know what to do. You have overprotection because it hurts. You have self-isolation, maybe COVID, maybe something else. Maybe you don't have a friend group that's going to kick your butt and get you off the couch. Maybe your fear of making it worse. So then you go in an activity and you don't move. And you're like, no, if I don't use it, it's fine. It's going to be fine. So then you end up getting this systemic dysfunction is what we call it. You get self, low self-esteem, poor quality of life, poor, you know, symptoms get worse. You have deconditioning and detraining and then you get metabolic issues, right? Such as weight gain, diabetes, things like that. But then because it hurts, you just get stuck going around and around and around and around. So it just gets worse. It spirals. But then you know, physical activity, deconditioning, more pain, depression leads to that because pain always hurts and that really sucks. Then you have disability, you can't do things, you don't go out and do things. You get catastrophizing where that's a word we use for like the patient thinks the worst case scenario is always going to be the scenario. And then you have fear of movement and then you get back to more physical activity and again, spiral and spiral and spiral. With all of this, you get tired, right? You have metabolic issues, um, diabetes, weight, things like that. Uh, shortness of breath, you're exhausted, you don't have very good nutrition, you get tired, you get physically inactive, then you can go down to decrease neuromuscular function. So you lose your muscle mass, your strength, your ability, your coordination, your cardiovascular issues. You, you It's harder, like going up the stairs, takes your breath away. It leads to, you know, you get malnutrition because you're not using things, you get backlog of stuff, you get inflammation, you get physical uh, functioning decreases, and then you just keep going around and around and around. So how do you break the cycle? Benefits of physical activity. These are some wonderful stats, like this is insane. So in clinical studies and papers, clinical significance, which means like it worked, is normally 20 to 30% or higher. All of this research through here Dementia, down by 30%. Hip fractures and fall risks, 68%. 
depression, 30%, breast cancer, colon cancer, type 2 diabetes, 20, 30, and 40, cardiovascular disease, heart, heart attacks, and strokes, 35%, cause, all cause mortality, 30%. That's just by being physically active, which means parking maybe a little bit farther from the shopping center. As long as it's not icy, please do not slip and die. Maybe going to the mall if it is slippy, slippery and walking in laps before they, like just before they open. That's wonderful. This one really hits home. Global deaths per year, 5.1 million from smoking, 5.3 million from inactivity. Where inactivity beats out smoking. What? That, that should not be a thing. So we're on a mission to change that. So the rewards outweigh the risks. That's really my whole point here. Because the best exercise is the one that gets done and it's not going to make your disease worse. It's anything going to make it better. You do have to find, see a little asterisk there, you have to find the right exercise for you. And that can be a little bit of trial and error. You may need someone in your corner to help you with that. So where can I find more information? Glad Canada, Thrive Center is fantastic. These are all the groups that I've talked about today. And I did that on purpose because a lot of them are local. You can always contact me. Contact Linda. Contact Louise. They have wonderful, wonderful resources for you. Or ask your medical providers. Ask them because they're not going to look into it unless you ask. Most in uh, Calgary know about the GLAD program. Most know about the Thrive Center, um, things like that. So we are very lucky with that. But you know what? Test them. We sometimes need that. I love when people bring stuff to me and I say, I don't know. But let me look into it and I'll get back to you. Um, any questions or did we all fall asleep? <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, yeah. Oh. Linda, you're still on mute. I added the link for fair entry uh, in Calgary. So that's a city of Calgary thing. Um, and I also added something from rehab science at University of Saskatchewan, where I understand they have two classes per week that are sitting, sitting classes. And Wonderful. one thing I also wanted to mention was people we have some people who like quite literally can't get up off their couch. Like they just, their feet hurt so bad. They can maybe go from the couch to the bathroom and back and, and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. you can always adapt exercises for say, always. some people like even laying down. If you want to do leg lifts while you're laying down, if you want to lift weights, it was like small weights, just to start slow and then grow from there. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. Vic? Uh, well, Can I you? had a wonderful time, everyone. I'll linger for a few more minutes and then uh, hopefully everyone learned a few things or maybe reinforced a few things you already knew.